Äh, ja, äh, danke schön. Äh, äh, guten Abend, Damen und Herren. Ja, ich war in Bielefeld, darum kann, sollte ich auch Deutsch sprechen können. Äh, leider habe ich nur zu selten die Gelegenheit, um Deutsch zu sprechen, auch hier, weil die Leute für die Leute hier sprechen Englisch ist, äh, so gut, dass ich eigentlich äh, kein Deutsch sprechen kann, selbst wenn ich in Deutschland bin. Herzlichen Dank jedenfalls für diese Einladung, äh, Bernie, äh, Wicke, äh, Fabienne. Äh, diese Einladung, um über eine einfache Idee, einen einfachen Vorschlag zu reden, einen Vorschlag, der in den letzten Jahren in der ganzen Welt viel Interesse geweckt hat, aber der vielleicht als Folge unserer heutigen vielfältigen Krisen vergessen sein soll. Don't worry, I'm going to speak uh, in English and moreover, I'm not going to speak for a full hour because uh, I've already been speaking too much over the last four days at the seminar we had uh, together. And then this afternoon I had a difficult choice between having a little nap or exploring the old town. And I went for the old town. I don't regret it, it's beautiful, but I may fall asleep before I finish my lecture. So, um, uh, yes, I, I'm going to speak about a very simple idea but also an idea that at first sight is crazy. Uh, yes, so uh, I'm, I'm just a, as a, a didactic reminder, uh, not necessary for most of you, but perhaps useful for uh, some others, that a simple idea is the idea of commonly called unconditional basic income or for short basic income. Uh, that is an income, uh, a regular, uh, that is a regular cash payment, like what you know in Germany now since the 1st of January under the name Bürgergeld, so it's a regular cash payment, but unlike Bürgergeld, it is being paid to every member of some particular uh, political community, for example, to every permanent resident of a country. It's being paid to all of them. One, in, and here I list three features which uh, are indicate the difference between this basic income and what exists in Germany now under the name Bürgergeld, but previously under the name Hartz IV, and exists in many other uh, countries, developed countries, in France it's called the uh, Revenu de Solidarité Active, in Italy now it's called the uh, Reddito di Cittadinanza, but in other countries further away, like in Brazil, it's called Borsa Familia. And so there are three differences between basic income and those other schemes. The first one is that it is uh, given, this basic income is given on an individual basis, on a strictly individual basis, you don't need to know who you live with in order to know whether you are entitled to it and uh, what level of benefit you are going to receive. Some people will say, well, this is a crazy idea because surely if you live with other people, your expenditure will be less than if you live alone. Yes, that is correct. There are economies of scale, yet a basic income is strictly individual. One doesn't need to know who you live with in order to determine whether you are entitled to it and how much your income will be. Two, it's uh, universal. That is, there is no means test, no income test. Does that mean that it's given to the rich as well as to the poor? Isn't that crazy? Maybe it looks crazy, uh, but yes, that is the case. Basic income is given to the rich as well as to the poor. And finally, thirdly, it's also uh, given uh, ob in an obligation-free way. That is, uh, there is no work test. It is not restricted to the people who either work or are available on the labor market or, or are unable to work. No, it's given to all, even to the people who choose to quit their job, the people who refuse the jobs that are being offered. Isn't that crazy? 
perhaps it looks crazy, but that is what it is. A basic income, strictly individual, it is universal in the sense that there is no means test, and it is obligation-free in the sense that there is no uh, work test. Now, it looks crazy, it's not so crazy, and so along with other people uh, around the world have tried to explain why it's not so crazy, and so the uh, last time I tried to do that in a systematic way was in this big book with uh, lots of uh, references at uh, the end of the book for the hard workers who want to really look at issues in detail. So we published this uh, with a, a younger colleague, we published that with uh, 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 Harvard University Press. Since then it's been published in uh, uh, 11, I think, uh, different languages. The, the, there's a Japanese edition that just came out uh, recently. Uh, the Koreans in the room will recognize the Korean edition. There are two Chinese editions, one that was very quick in Taiwan, uh, the year it was published uh, at uh, Harvard, and then one that took a long time uh, because it got stuck in the censorship office in Beijing and in the end was uh, published uh, in Shanghai. Anyway, the, there is a Russian edition as well. Um, but that means that there was a real demand for it throughout the world and uh, it's uh, a book I felt, you know, when you've been working on something for a long time, it gets a bit boring and so uh, you, uh, it may get repetitive and so fortunately, as was mentioned by Bernie, I did work on many other topics uh, in between. Uh, but I felt I had a special obligation towards that ID because as the ID was becoming more popular, there was more and more fake news about that ID used by the supporters and by the critics. There were more and more flawed arguments about it and I thought it was important to produce a, a book that could be, uh, provide reliable information and reliable clarifying uh, arguments uh, on all aspects uh, of uh, that idea from the history to uh, the ethics of it, the philosophy of it, uh, the economics and uh, the uh, politics. So uh, I won't spend time uh, this, uh, this evening uh, explaining why I think and other, thing, other people, including uh, the people working at Freebies, think it's not that uh, crazy uh, an idea. But I shall just note at this point that this ID became recently, uh, but only uh, recently, uh, very uh, popular. Uh, and uh, uh, I say only recently, so initially, uh, I mean, if you go back in history, there were a couple of people in the 19th century who had that ID, at the very end of the 18th century, 19th century, but no one listened. Uh, then there was a bit of a debate in England after the First World War, it died out. There was a bit of a debate in the United States in the late 60s, it died out. And then there was a debate gradually starting in Europe from the early uh, 80s. <coughs> but initially it was a matter of a few activists, a few academics in, interested in this idea. And then it really exploded in 2016 because of a conjunction of different things. Of course, it's not by chance that this happened at the time, there are underlying trends, but what happened in 2016 is that at about the same time you had a national uh, referendum in Switzerland that was initiated by uh, various people, including one in the room, namely Enno Schmidt, uh, who is standing there uh, at uh, the back. Uh, the, there was first a, collect, a collection of uh, signatures, etc. And, uh, and then there was a referendum, the, the proposal was defeated, but many people in the world said, hmm, if even the Swiss are considering that idea, there must be something in it. And then you had shortly afterwards, about the same time, the announcement that a right of centre government in Finland was uh, pro uh, had decided to have a basic human exper uh, experiment. In fact, the most serious, the most sophisticated experiment on basic income ever huh, was going to happen, was decided in 2016, was going to happen in Finland. And that actually happened then between the 1st of January 
2017 and the 31st of December uh, 2018. And then, as if that was not enough, uh, you had the candidate for president from the ruling Socialist Party in France, Benoît Hamon, uh, won the primaries, and so uh, he first won the primaries with as essential proposal le revenu universel, universal basic income. And he was standing for the primaries against the standing prime minister at the time, Manuel Valls, defeated him, and then went for the uh, general election the, against uh, Macron, among other, and there was uh, pathetically defeated, if I uh, must say. But again, if even the candidate for the ruling party in a country like France is defending that idea, advocating that idea, uh, also galvanizing the enthusiasm of so many people, people say, well, there must be something in it. Even if it's, even if he's defeated, people not only in France, not only in Switzerland, not only in Finland, started thinking more seriously about that idea. And then it wasn't, uh, it was, the story wasn't finished. And we are, uh, then we turn to what uh, Bernie was uh, alluding to, then you had the pandemic in 2020. And then, uh, and what happened? A number, a number of countries in the world, people saying, were saying what we need is an emergency universal uh, basic income. Meaning uh, by that, something that would really be given to everyone because you suddenly had all these people who were not properly insured because they never expected this to happen to them. Many people self-employed, uh, in a number of countries, people in the, in the uh, informal economy who were suddenly deprived of any means of subsistence. Now, you could imagine very finely targeted uh, measures that would reach the, only the people who had lost their livelihood, but you needed it urgently. And, and so, what happened? Even in the United States of Donald Trump, you had then, for a number of months, an income that was sent to people, strictly individual, no household test, to universal, no means test, the rich and the poor received it. And three, obligation free. It was given to the people who were working, who were looking for work, who were not looking for work, the housewives, uh, the students, every, uh, everyone received it. So you had, in the US essentially, there were, I mean, needed some qualification, you had suddenly what so many people said, it's impossible, it's a utopia, and so hey, you had it for a number of months. And so as a result uh, of all that, so of what happened in uh, 2016, and then what happened uh, in 2020, uh, and in between you had also uh, Andrew Yang in the United States, that was in, also in, for the election of 2020, also a presidential candidate for the primaries of the Democratic Party, he was defeated, but uh, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, he again, I mean, his central proposal was uh, this idea of uh, universal basic uh, income. So the pandemic then looked to some, and to some extent, it was a fantastic booster for the prospects of universal basic income. But I have to disappoint those who thought so, for the pandemic also dampened, damaged uh, those uh, prospects, and even more so today, as the pandemic has been joined uh, by two other major crises, namely the climate change crisis, which of course is much older, uh, but uh, acquired a greater, an even greater salience uh, recently, and uh, two, uh, was also joined even more recently than at the uh, beginning of uh, last uh, year by the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, so, um, I, and so therefore this is what I'm going to explain, why uh, uh, the, there is, why these three crises and the conjunction of these crises are really bad news for the prospect of a basic income. 
I presented already these reasons not so long ago in the keynote address I gave for the, for the 20th Congress of the Basic Income Earth Network. And so Basic Income, uh, also called BIEN. So BIEN is a, a network that was founded in uh, Louvain-la-Neuve, in my university town in uh, uh, 1986 as a Basic Income European network. Uh, then, uh, under the pressure of a number of people from outside Europe, including Eduardo Suplicy from Brazil, he present. It was then turned into a worldwide network in 2004. It held uh, its uh, most recent uh, uh, congress in Brisbane in uh, Australia. The next one will be in Korea, so it's really a worldwide network, as the idea of basic income became uh, discussed and uh, advocated in an ever uh, larger number of uh, countries in the world. But I choose also in this address to people who uh, worldwide who are in favor of basic income, uh, I, uh, in this address I wanted to convey the bad news uh, from the basic income, uh, which I do this evening to uh, an educated, more or less uh, general public, but I found it important to do that also for uh, basic income advocates because I believe that it is of decisive importance for the strength and therefore the success of an idea, of a proposal, of a cause, that it should not be shielded from bad news, uh, that its advocates should be honestly exposed to uh, real difficulties and real objections, however unpleasant uh, that may sometimes be. So, what are uh, the reasons for uh, believing that the current threefold uh, crisis is bad news for uh, universal basic income? And there are two aspects uh, which uh, I want to go through. Uh, one concerns the enhanced competition for public resources, uh, for public expenditures, coming from the, all three of these crises. And secondly, there is perhaps more importantly, a negative impact on the productivity of labor. So I'll be fairly elliptic about uh, each of uh, these things, but I hope not uh, too much so that you can at least get the intuition behind each of uh, these arguments. And these, there will be uh, two times and uh, twice uh, three uh, 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 arguments. And so in each time for these two aspects, uh, one corresponding to each of these crises. Those familiar with the discussion on basic income will know that the real cost to the public purse of introducing a universal basic income is far less than its apparent cost. And the apparent cost of universal basic income is simply the amount of the basic income multiplied by the number of beneficiaries. And for example, the adult population in, uh, in the German Federal uh, Republic. But in all sensible proposals of a basic income for a country like Germany, the introduction of a basic income goes hand in hand with the suppression, the replacement of a number of existing uh, measures, existing uh, schemes, uh, uh, whether in the form of uh, tax exemptions or for the lower tranche of everyone's income and a number of benefits that would no longer serve a purpose once you have a basic income. But yet, even so, there will be a, a net cost because at, some, at least uh, when you introduce a basic income, at least some households, some people will be net uh, gainers. And these uh, people, uh, these people will tend to be part-time workers, but also a number of people who uh, uh, a number of people who would get a basic income as a result of being paid more automatically than the existing uh, means-tested uh, scheme. Therefore, uh, given that there will be a net cost, there will be competition for the use of public money. Uh, whether the governments uh, find this money through taxation, but also through uh, money creation, uh, through a return on sovereign funds. 
So let's quickly look at the form taken by this enhanced competition for each of these crises. Climate change first. No doubt some people will say, are saying, how can you spend that money on unconditional benefits when we badly, urgently need public investment to address climate change? For example, to provide insulation in all in, on a massive scale in public housing in order to uh, uh, be able to, uh, for poor people, poor people to save energy on heating. So why waste all that money instead of directing it at these urgent needs? The pandemic. Uh, other people, perhaps the same people, will say, how can you waste all this money on unconditional benefits when we urgently need to prepare for future pandemics by investing in precautionary stocks of, of masks, of medical equipment, uh, by uh, providing a sufficient number of intensive care um, units, also by recruiting more healthcare staff and paying them better. Huh? Moreover, people will say, if you introduce a basic income, this will lead some of these nurses who do a hard job to reduce their working time, and in order to recruit enough nurse, nurses, you'll have, it will, uh, you'll have to, to train more nurses, you'll have to pay them better in order to attract them to this job, and all this will be very expensive. And if you do all that, there will be no money left for uh, basic income. And thirdly, most dramatically, most pathetically, there is the war. Hmm? Other people again, we say, how can you waste that money on unconditional benefits when we urgently need to increase our military spending, as was decided in Germany and in many other countries, in order to support Ukrainian resistance, in order to strengthen our own defense here in Europe, uh, uh, in order to rely less on, uh, the, uh, on American uh, military uh, interventions. Indeed, some have proposed fun in, in and so in, in the history of basic income, uh, a number of people have proposed funding a basic income through a reduction in the, uh, the city expenditure on, uh, on armaments and, and on uh, uh, military people. A number of people have proposed that, but now we are doing the reverse uh, uh, under the pressure of uh, the, Rus the, uh, the, the war between, uh, 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 between Russia and uh, in Ukraine, and we, uh, this money we are we could be spending on uh, uh, social policies is being spent on building, buying tanks and missiles. So you can see that climate, the pandemic, the war, each in in its own way, and uh, with the strong support of the corresponding lobby, huh? the the people producing the weapons, producing the solar energy equipment or, or the insulation for the houses or uh, the big pharma saying you need to invest in more vaccines and, and all that. So you can see how, um, uh, how uh, with the support of the corresponding lobbies and a segment of significant segment of the electorate in each case, uh, you can see how these various crises are out to grab whatever public money one might have loved to use in order to cover this net cost of universal basic income. So this all looks bad, but there is worse to come. Uh, for uh, climate change, uh, the pandemic and the war also uh, not only suck public resources, but they also depress the productivity of labor. And this is very important for uh, the discussion on basic income because one common way, and in my view sound way, of thinking about the universal basic income has been to see it as a tool for transforming productivity gains not into increases of overall material production or consumption um, or, or in, into forced uh, unemployment, but into an increase in and turning this productivity increase into an expansion of the real freedom of, uh, of everyone, real freedom to choose what to do with our lives, and in particular the real freedom to reduce working time 
and to switch to more meaningful paid or unpaid activity. And the second problem, so this second aspect, the second problem with climate change, with the pandemic, with the war, is that they all challenge our complacent faith in rising productivity. Let me quickly explain that. Climate change, this should be obvious. For, uh, and it's obvious that this is the case for the constraints imposed by our concern with the climate, and more generally with ecological limits. The level of labor, of the productivity of labor that is being enjoyed so far is partly owed to an unsustainable depletion of natural resources. And uh, we are now well aware also to an irresponsible disturbance of the climate of our planet. Whether we let these consequences unfold, that is, and the climate to, to, to make even more damaging, uh, 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 creating even greater damages in various parts of the world, destroying infrastructure through floods, uh, uh, displacing people from where they used to live because of droughts, whether we let these consequences unfold, or uh, whether we strongly constrain, uh, uh, constrain our mismanagement of the planet to avoid them by making all sorts of uh, investment, this can only result in a fall in the productivity of labor, understood as the amount of material welfare generated per unit of labor. And the very fact that we can no longer use all these natural resources and, and, and pollute uh, free of charge means that we'll, in order to produce the same level of material welfare, we'll have to use more labor. And so it's intrinsic to this that, uh, that it implies a, product, a decline in the productivity, or, or, or that it depresses the productivity of labor. Right. Secondly, the pandemic uh, and the threat of future uh, pandemics is also reflected in a fall of productivity uh, sensibly interpreted. And you have the inefficiencies that are entailed by lockdowns and other uh, constraints aimed at preventing the spreading of uh, the virus. Uh, all this, you know, lots of things that you used to do efficiently, you have to do less efficiently now. Uh, secondly, there is uh, this, all the, the, the medical equipment, uh, which uh, the, accumulate uh, for the sake of uh, precaution, you develop vaccines, etc. Hopefully you will never need them, uh, so in which case you do all this work uh, with no uh, utility resulting for it. And in case uh, you do have to use all this, you may say, well, then it's a contribution to GDP. Well, not, not really, but it's really uh, uh, pre uh, all this you may show in GDP, uh, because this will correspond to paid work, etc. But what it is doing is not really increasing our material welfare, but preventing <coughs> that welfare from falling as a result of these unprecedented uh, public health uh, problems. Finally, and uh, again very obviously in the case of uh, the war, what's happening uh, now is that a growing part of uh, some of our country's labor is devoted to uh, military uh, activities, even if it means uh, just producing things in order to be able to buy tanks or missiles produced elsewhere. And, uh, and this equipment and these activities, in the best case, they will be left unused, in which case the, it's, uh, and the result is uh, neutral in terms of impact on, the, uh, on, uh, on, on welfare. And in the worst case, of course, it will serve to destroy somewhere consumption and investment goods and indeed uh, human beings. The conclusion is that in conclusion of this a quick overview is that in the gloomy productivity depressing world uh, in which we are due to this uh, threefold crisis, little seems to be left of the hopeful uh, perspective of using rises in productivity to fund uh, universal basic income. Right. So, can I stop the lecture here and let you go home completely depressed, or should I continue? Uh.
Uh, we are continuing a little bit, right? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, I shall continue because yet, yet, uh, a universal basic income has lost none of its relevance, quite of the contrary even, because of three arguments, I'm now going to formulate three arguments that may not capture our main reason for supporting basic income. I'm not here giving an overview of all the reasons we may have to support uh, a basic income, especially the most fundamental ones, may not be explicitly formulated, but uh, these three arguments are key in today's public debate and are stronger than ever in my uh, view. That's uh, and so what I'm going to go against uh, fairly elliptically what I'm going uh, to uh, go through and so the, these three arguments will relate one to uh, the idea of a fair sharing of productivity losses, two uh, the idea of freedom as a productive force and finally about the sort of utopia we need uh, today more than ever. First then, um, uh, it's important to see that the universal basic income can not only operate as a liberating way of sharing the benefits of productivity gains, and with the way in which this has often, uh, uh, people have often argued in favor of basic income, but the universal basic income can also operate as a simple and at least a roughly fair uh, way of sharing the cost of productivity losses. Typical example, I'll just give one illustration that should be enough to give you the intuition. Typical example is the idea of a carbon dividend funded by a carbon tax. Carbon tax or carbon fee, uh, if you have a, a sale of uh, emission rights, a carbon tax is a, pot a potentially very powerful way of making us reduce the overuse of natural resources, especially, but not only, uh, the, uh, among these natural resources, especially the capacity of our atmosphere to digest our emissions. A carbon dividend, uh, that is uh, a dividend that is uh, funded, that is financed by this carbon tax, is a simple way of reducing the impact of this tax on the standard of living by overcompensating on average the poor households with emit uh, on average less uh, carbon and, um, uh, uh, and while at the same time undercompensating richer households who consume more on average and therefore generate a more emission uh, carbon, uh, a more em uh, therefore emit more, more carbon. It is sometimes proposed to means test uh, the carbon dividend, so to pay this carbon dividend only to poorer households, that would make the scheme more, the, the overall scheme more progressive, more favorable to the worst off. But a uniform dividend has, of course, the advantage of greater simplicity, of greater legibility, and uh, of not deepening the poverty trap, because if you give it only to the poor, well, as soon as they become a bit less poor, they lose the advantage of this uh, dividend and also of not requiring some sort of arbitrary cut-off point. And so it, uh, unsurprisingly, from California to Korea, uh, in, in, in Europe also today, it has a, a, a uniform carbon dividend, so basic income funded by a carbon tax has therefore often been proposed throughout the world and sometimes even in some places in the world actually implemented. So that's the first reason why people keep coming back to this idea of basic income precisely because of the ecological challenges we uh, face. Secondly, and more importantly, more, far more general argument, uh, freedom as a productive force. Um, the fact of First, it's important to uh, understand that the fact that all three crises, uh, all three crises, for the reasons mentioned before, put a strong downward pressure on labor productivity, does not entail that labor productivity will decrease. Why not? 
because this downward pressure could in principle be offset by the pro by technological progress in other in other by technological progress in general, particularly the progress of automation, of robotization, uh, by also uh, various forms of resource saving technological advances that are precisely prompted by uh, a modified price structure due to carbon tax, etc. Moreover, and so uh, first point is that it's not because the three crises lead to uh, uh, not because the three crises depress the, la the level of labor productivity that labor productivity will decrease because there are other factors affecting this labor productivity. Moreover, and that's the key point, universal basic income itself can be expected to boost productivity. The freedom it gives by providing basic economic security is a productive force for two sets of reasons, huh, which I'm quickly going through. First, the security it offers makes it possible to better use and uh, to better mobilize the existing human capital. Mm. In other words, to waste less of people's productive capacities. Three, three dimensions of that, three aspects. First, as the Finnish experiment has illustrated uh, very convincingly, perhaps more rigorously than anything else, the security deriving from the unconditionally of the transfer. And when you go from a system like a good, you get to a really unconditional one, well, reduces the stress of the long-term unemployed, uh, uh, some of the most vulnerable, and therefore enables them to use, and that was shown also by, uh, by uh, uh, cognitive psychologists, enables them to use a broader mental uh, uh, bandwidth to think more clearly, to make more rational choices, to have a more positive view about their future, and thereby to use better, to make a better use of their own capacities, which otherwise are completely destroyed by the stressful situation in which they are. That's one. Secondly, the sheer fact that you could reduce your working time or interrupt your career when you feel you are reaching your limits can allow you to avoid a burnout and uh, in the end you, it will enable you to work longer than you would otherwise have been able to do. And again, and it's, this, this is very for the people in work now, I'm not speaking about the unemployed, and the very, cap the very fact that you have this possibility of reducing more easily your working time, may, maybe it's one of the factors that may, by avoiding burnouts or similar wallouts also, enable you to work longer and therefore to better use your own human capital. And finally, there is this idea of uh, 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 universal basic income, to use Mark Zuckerberg's uh, expression, and the boss of uh, Facebook, he said the universal basic income can work as a cushion to try new ideas, or what's sometimes called in the Silicon Valley, basic income is a sort of venture capital for the people. It enables people to take productive risks and therefore to make also better use of their own human capital. But it's not only uh, uh, the unleashing, uh, basic income doesn't only help to unleash existing human capital, it also boosts the development of human capital, of productive capacities. I mentioned three aspects. One, the greater security it gives to parents and uh, the, also the, the among others, through the facilitation of their part-time work, enables them to give to their children a more serene, a more caring environment, and this is, of course, uh, more conducive to the flourishing of these children as human beings in general, and in particular as protect, prospective uh, productive workers. Secondly, the unconditional nature of an unconditional basic income enables workers and prospective workers to discriminate between jobs that teach them nothing, uh, lousy jobs where that are not only boring but uh, where uh, that don't train them in order to improve their skills, and between those jobs and then uh, jobs that may be just as badly paid but are worth doing despite the low pay because of their, uh, for they can learn thanks to these jobs. 
a universal basic income is a, an instrument for the systematic bottom-up screening of the jobs according to their non-pecuniary qualities, not least their contribution uh, to uh, building up the human capital, the skills of the incumbents of these jobs. And so, second uh, aspect of this development of human capital is really that it, uh, basic income, because of its obligation-free aspect, it gives people, workers, the power, the bargaining power to choose between jobs with high training uh, and, uh, and, and low training. And that means there is a systematic bias in the development of jobs in favor of those that provide more training. And finally, the universal uh, basic income is also a natural complement of uh, lifelong learning. It is a, a grant that can be used as a student grant or as, a, as an internship subsidy at any point in life. It democratizes aspect to unpaid internships at the beginning of people's career and it, uh, and, and, and it also it, uh, facilitates a smooth back and forth throughout life between employment and education. Of course, no precise figure can be put on the size of these six uh, effects. And indeed, uh, how much of an effect each will have, uh, will each uh, of these dimensions will have, will be very sensitive to local circumstances and to accompanying measures. But the key point is that under contemporary circumstances, more than ever, it is an illusion to believe that the productivity of our economy will be boosted by coercing people into jobs they hate doing and will do badly, more than can be gained by developing an institutional structure that eases people into jobs that they like doing and that they do well, while at the same time being useful to their organization and to society. This is one of the recurrent messages also from Götz Werner, and so um, with nice examples from his own firm. Uh, 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 universal basic income is an important ingredient in this institutional structure that can help achieve that. So to sum, uh, to sum up at this uh, second and last argument, the undesirable negative impact of today's threefold crisis, climate, uh, pandemic and war, uh, and the, the undesirable negative impact uh, of these crises on productivity doesn't mean that producti productivity must decline, in part because of independent technological developments and in part because the universal basic income, the universal basic income itself can contribute to boosting productivity through these various uh, channels. Um, I should note, uh, just briefly note at this point, uh, that uh, uh, in several countries attempts are made on and off to micro-simulate the introduction of universal basic income in order to assess its sustainability and desirability. One such attempt uh, was made recently in Germany in 2021 at the request of the Bundesfinanzministerium uh, then headed by the current Chancellor Olaf uh, Scholz. Uh, but prompted, and this attempt was made uh, because it was also prompted by the uh, then recently growing popularity of the idea of basic income also in Germany. Uh, the, this Gutachten is explicitly motivated uh, in this way. This uh, report to the, Berlin, to, to the German government was uh, examined then various scenarios and concluded that uh, a basic income is uh, unsustainable, at least as, at a level that uh, promises existence für alle. So uh, that is sufficient to live on. Such exercises, as was done in this Gutachten, are very useful. First, to estimate in purely static terms, uh, that is, assuming no change in economic behavior, in uh, labor supply, 
first to estimate the impact of various reforms, various scenarios on the distribution of income between different types of households and on the tax rates that face. It's also useful to estimate as reliably as possible the likely impact on the supply of labor of different segments of the active population. And so that participation in the labor market and how much else they are going to work. But there are all sorts of reservations that have to be made because of the assumptions that enter these uh, dynamic models. And the most fundamental limit of the relevance of all this is the fact that the most important dimension in the economic discussion of universal basic income is simply ignored. And this most important dimension is the uh, impact on uh, human capital mobilization and human capital um, uh, development. So uh, my third and, well, the third and last uh, uh, argument I uh, announced uh, uh, is about the sort of utopia we need. Especially in darker and gloomier times, we need not just vague dreams of a better world, but we need concrete, realistic, sustainable utopias. Especially in an uncertain, crisis-ridden, shock-prone world, we need a utopia of security, the sort of security that can be provided by a reliable income, by a sturdy floor, and by the facilitation also of the regular updating of one's skills. Especially in a world in which we can expect our freedoms to be constrained by the need to address climate change and other ecological challenges. Uh, constrained also by the need to prevent the spreading of pandemics. Constrained possibly even by the increasing threat of terrorism and war, especially then in a world in which our freedoms are being constrained, we need a utopia of greater freedom, precisely rooted in the greater security which a universal basic income would provide. Don't misunderstand me. This utopia of freedom is not a utopia of dolce vita, of self-indulgence, of laziness. Yes, a universal basic income will enable the most stressed among us to relax. It will enable the most challenged among us to slow down. It will enable those currently stuck in lousy jobs to escape from them. But the challenges of our societies, the challenges of our world um, uh, today are formidable. In particular, but not only those stemming from the three crises I discussed. And to address those challenges, every one of us is useful, every one of us is needed, every one of us is urged to do their share, not least those who, as most of you in this room, have the privilege to be highly educated, not least those, as most of you in this room, who have the privilege to be born in an affluent part of the world. The plea for universal basic income must therefore be uh, uh, go. It must therefore go hand in hand with a plea for mobilization. But mobilization doesn't amount to conscription into full-time, lifelong wage labor. The possibility for all to access a meaningful paid job is important, and universal basic income is meant not as an alternative to it, but as a way of achieving it under current technological and economic conditions. But the best societal contribution one can make in some dimensions, in some periods of our lives, can take the form of an unpaid activity rather than of a paid job. And that too, a universal basic income is meant to facilitate. So, to conclude, yes, climate change, the pandemic, the war are bad news for a universal basic income. But a universal basic income, appropriately calibrated, appropriately framed, appropriately embedded, among other measures, is not only sustainable despite the threat that formed, the threat formed by this crisis, it is also part of what we need to address successfully 
the many challenges that stem from these crises. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.